Welcome to Gear Talk. Talking gear. We're back. Season two, Zach. Yes. 2021. Yeah, I was going to say, more importantly, it's 2021. Yes. Do we have any closing remarks on 2020? Peace out, 2020. Good, good riddance. I think everybody <laughs> kind of feels that way. No harm in ringing in the new year just repeatedly, I think, in 2021. I agree. 100%. How did you uh, enjoy the holiday break? It was awesome. A lot of good time with the family. Uh, a lot of good stuff with the kids. You see any movies? Um, you know, I did. Hey, I got HBO. Yeah. Wonder Woman 1984 came out. I figured, hey, why not? What'd you think oh, of it? I heard it was awesome. Didn't see it. <laughs> Didn't see it? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, we caught up on the Queen's Gambit. We got pretty wrapped up into that. What'd you think? Oh, no. Didn't see that one either. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you got kids. I know yep. you must have saw uh, Pixar's Soul. No. Didn't see that one either. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> My man. <laughs> The kids saw it. They enjoyed it. That, okay. So the kids yeah. got some Pixar time. Yep. Just not you. Just not me. That concludes the uh, Gear Talk media wrap-up. There we go. <laughs> Let's get into the show today. So we're back for season two. We are very happy to be joined by Michael Pedersen and Sure. Yes. Uh, sure Historian. The Sure Historian. Uh, what other companies in our industry even have a historian. I think when you've been around for 95 years, it becomes important to assign someone to collect all the details <laughs> from throughout your history. Uh, we're really excited. Michael's got a, a long history, we're sure. He's got some history in this territory. Yep. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, Michael is open to uh, a bit of a Q&A at the end of our interview. So if you've got anything sure related, and he actually prefers to try to be stumped. Yes. So... If Bring you've got questions. a long, law sure question you've always want answered, uh, really now's the time. Very much so. Get in the chat. Let us know. We're also going to be talking to Daryl Harris. Yes. Of the Music Matters podcast. Mm -hmm. Of Cirque de Soleil bass player. Yes, very much so. Of um, all sorts of things. Yeah. Daryl is a, a bit of a renaissance man these days. He's coming to us live from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to be talking to him about the MV7. Yeah, baby. Let's be honest, some people out there are probably already wondering, we've been talking about these giveaways, MV51, MV7, SRH 440. Uh, let's get to it. Let's get to it, right into it. So we put out a post on Facebook and we said, sign up for the Gear Talk newsletter on the Audio Gear website. And anyone who signed up over the last week was entered to win an MV51. Yep. And we just did the drawing, of course, right? We just did the drawing. Uh, unofficial drum roll, please. Congratulations, Kenny Miller. Kenny Miller. Of Biola University. Awesome. Congratulations, Kenny. Kenny, if you're out there, congratulations. There's the official, you know, so, so you can tell it was written down. Yep. <laughs> That's as, about as official <laughs> as we get. Um, anybody who wants to request a, a recount, uh, sign up for the Gear Talk newsletter. Yes. And, and let us know. <laughs> uh, if you'd like a uh, but the important thing is we're not done giving away stuff. No, we're not. We have two more to give away. Two more. Yep. The How are MV7 you seven. Mm -hmm. We're going to give away today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the MV7. Then we're going to talk to Daryl about how he uses it in yep. his podcast. Uh, listen, you're going to want to listen closely because we're going to ask you a question about the MV7 at the end of the episode. You're going to get in the chat. First one with the correct answer. Wins the MV7. It's going to win. So make sure you pay attention. Zach, what about the SRH 440s? SRH 440s, uh, again, you're going to want to sign up for our Audio Gear uh, Facebook page. You subscribe. And anybody who subscribes, we're going to open it up, and we're going to keep it open for five days so you could subscribe after the show. And we're going to pick a winner to win the SRH 440s. So we're going to announce it on Facebook. So if you didn't win, if you're not Kenny Miller, if you didn't win the MV51, uh, remember, you got a shot to win the MV7. But you can still win the SRH 440s. Just sign up, audiogear.com. How do we spell gear in Audio Gear, Zach? Two E's. Big fans of E's here. Uh, audiogear.com. Uh, there it is. Thank you, Justin. Uh, go ahead and click subscribe there. You'll get all of our Gear Talk updates um, across all the manufacturers. Yes, sir. Okay, let's get into news and updates because we've been off for six weeks. Six weeks, that's uh, right. A lot kind of happened in the sure world. Yes, it has. I guess that happens when you're sure and you're a big company and you've got <laughs> lots of things going on. But Quite it, a few things. It is award season. Mm -hmm. Oscars, Grammys, I assume those things are happening. Yes. Uh, assuming things are going to happen is probably not a good idea now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, but the AV Magazine Award for Innovation of the Year. It's a big award. Sure. Congratulations. 
wasn't specific about which innovation, so we're going to just take it as like a, an innovation on the whole. On the whole. And we really appreciate it. Thank you, AV Magazine. Thank you, AV Magazine. <laughs> uh, music and sound. Uh, these are some nominations. Yep. Uh, but we're really excited. SLXD. Great wireless product. Now, we did a, a short run through of SLXD with Brandon on our Gear Talk uh, episode four, mm -hmm. season one. So if you want, check that out on our YouTube page. SLXD is nominated for best wireless. Yep. And product of the year. Product of the year. That's huge. Sure is nominated for manufacturer of the year. Manufacturer of the year. So we're, we're really doing well there, music and sound. Thank you. Also, uh, Mark Bruner nominated posthumously Lifetime Achievement Award and induction into the Hall of Fame. Certainly well deserved. Very so much so. Thank you, music and sound, for recognizing Mark. We miss him. Uh, also, the Tech Awards mm -hmm. coming up. Next week is NAM, Zach. Wow. First time in, I think, 21 years, I'm not going to drive to a trade show. You know, I think you can still just drive over. I think I will, actually. Just to, just to park? Yeah. Last week, I went, and just as muscle memory, I was driving in to go pick up my badge. I was like, wait, there's no trade show next week. Yeah, we're, it, it, it's a little odd. Yeah. Uh, but uh, NAM will be virtual. Yes, it will. So check out what's coming up from Shure at the virtual NAM booth. More on that next week. In the meantime, Tech Award nominations. Yes. Axiant Digital Plug-On Transmitter, the, the AD3, AD3, nominated for Best Wireless Technology. Mm -hmm. We also have the Aonic 50 for a Tech Award for headphone technology as well. Best in headphone technology. And you know what? That takes us to what have you archived lately? Uh, Aonic 50s. We love them. Mm -hmm. We've got the black version here. Yes, we do. They're available in black or brown. They are now available in white. Oh, hey, we did it. Hey. Yes. <laughs> we, we were really practicing that one hard. Uh, thank you, Justin. We're quite happy we nailed that. Uh, so uh, black, brown, and white. But, Zach, yep. since we're nominated for best headphone technology, run us through real quick what makes these a Definitely. cool pair of headphones. Yeah. So, of course, it's Shure's first noise-canceling headphones that they've come out with. Uh, you got 20 hours of battery life on one charge, which is awesome. You have noise canceling technology. You also have ambient mode as well, environment mode. Uh, so when you put them on, you can put them on environment mode and actually have the ambience come in to the, to the earphones or to the headphones. Very slick. Uh, again, we also have a new price update on these bad boys. They were $399. Now they're only $349. Did also want to do a quick overview on the Aonic products because we do have a brand new line of, of earphones. Uh, we have the Aonic 2, uh, the Aonic 3 single driver, the Aonic 4, which is the dual driver hybrid. We also have the Aonic 5 as well. Um, and of course, I know, which is a triple driver earphone. I know we're going through those very, very fast, but good news is, is we do have an actual in-depth product overview on our YouTube channel. Uh, you just go to youtube.com forward slash audio gear. We have previous gear talks. We have open box videos, product updates. So just make sure you check that pretty regularly. We, we update the content quite regularly. Yeah, and, and you know what? We're happy to do some education, but really the best source if you want to get an in-depth chance to learn about these Sure products. We have the Sure Audio Institute. Sign up yes. here, create a profile. Oh, hey, look at that, award. another award. Stellar Service Award, thank you, Sound Contractor News. Uh, but get in here, sign up for the Audio Institute. You can take some specific courses on a whole host of Sure products. I mean, everything we make. <laughs> Just about <laughs> everything we make. Also, every webinar Sure does its archive there. And if we're getting any viewers, from the Sure Tech Talk, not Gear Talk, Tech Talk. Yeah. Talking Tech. Talking Tech. Uh, House of Worship series just started. Uh, the first, uh, I don't know if they call them episodes. We call them episodes. The first <laughs> in their series was today, started at 10 a.m. It is the second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. This yep. is the Tech Talk series for House of Worship, kind of running up to Easter here. So, very application specific, sure wireless, best practices, tips and tricks. Uh, so tune into that. Also, we've got the Next Sound Sessions. This is something Sure is doing in collaboration with AWAL or A W A L. Yeah, AWAL. Uh, also powered by Grammarphone. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I, I'm a bit old fashioned, Zach. I, I still get tripped up when words don't have the vowels that I expect to be there. I'm with you. Um, but very cool series we're doing. We are highlighting some up and coming artists. 
We've done three Next Sound sessions. We've got three more coming. So check this out. The next one, Thursday, January 21st. You can see the artists uh, that are going to be featured there. So uh, lots of things going on in the Sure world that we're really happy and excited about. Yeah. Great to start off our year with talking about Sure. Very exciting. I mean, tons of news, tons of updates, awards. I mean, you name it. Let's get into some microphone news. Ooh, we got one. We're going to be spending a lot of time today on microphones, as you might guess with Sure. Voila. The KSM8, the Dual Dyne. Uh -huh. We're going to be talking a lot about the Unidyne with Michael Pedersen in a little bit. Just a reminder, get your questions in for Michael yes. in the chat because we're coming over to him in really just a few minutes. But the Dual Dyne, the first cardioid dynamic dual diaphragm handheld microphone. What do we got? Well, it was priced at $499. We had a $100 price reduction on the handheld version. Comes in both nickel and in black, and it is now $399. So killer microphone for the price. Make sure you grab one. One more promotion that was extended is the Motive partnership with Adobe Premiere Rush. Yep. So this was active and is continuing until... May 31st. End of May. So for any Motive microphone, MV5, MV51, MV88, 88 uh -huh. plus, MV7. Yep. Um, when you buy your Motive microphone, hop over here to the Sure website and you can redeem your two month subscription to Adobe Premiere Rush. Definitely. Now, Zach, let's clear something up here uh -huh. um, because Adobe Premiere Rush, I'm editing my videos on my, my laptop, my PC. Um, but I can capture my videos with my Motive microphone yep. on my Sure Audio app. Yep, and you also have the Motive video app as well. So, capture with the Motive uh, microphone plugged into your mobile device, phone, tablet. Uh, use the Motive for video app because you get some really cool adjustments. Uh, different Motive microphones have different things you can do with them. We're gonna get into the details mm -hmm. here. Um, but if you need to offload those at home, edit, uh, you go ahead and use Adobe Premiere Rush first two months on us. For free. Uh, let's get into Motive, Zach, because uh, we want to talk a lot about the MV7, which yes. we're going to be giving away. Very much um, so. Let's talk about the Motive family as a whole. What distinguishes Motive from something like the beta line of microphones? Well, yeah, I mean, since its inception, you know, Motive was really made with the idea of having a touring musician be able to be on the road, be on the fly, and be able to get studio quality sound recorded on the fly without really having a whole bunch of gear, right? I mean, we used to be able to do that in the past, but in the past, how much gear would I have to bring with me in order to lay down a track on a good idea that I would have? It would be a lot of time, I would think. You know, I, if you're like me, if you're like musicians, we tend to get, uh, you know, pretty precious about our signal path, right? So we get your favorite mm -hmm. microphone, then you need a mixer that can provide phantom power if you're using a condenser mic, mm -hmm. you got cabling, you need an interface, you need a laptop, you might need a, a headphone amplifier. Uh, and by that time, the that, idea that, could have just been gone. That moment of inspiration that you just needed to get on tape as quick as you can. Um, tape, <laughs> tape was this thing we used to, you know, Future gear talk on, on what tape is. Yes. Um, <laughs> but you said it. Motive. Yep. Quick, easy, but high quality. Yeah, studio quality sound. It's got to sound good. Yep. If, lots of things are quick and easy. Motive sounds great. Definitely. Many people might have come to Motive recently as a work-from-home tool. Yeah, but that's not what it was invented for. You know, it, it's kind of adopted into that just because of where we've been pushed in 2020. But really, it was a tool for the musician to get studio quality sound and be able to record on the fly. I mean, because you could plug these things into your iPad, into your iPhone, into an Android device, into a PC, into a laptop. So anywhere that you're going, you can roll around with this little guy, your favorite microphone in your bag, and be able to jot down any idea quick and easy right away. Um, there is a, some similarities between the family of microphones, which is nice. Um, every one of the microphones does have a headphone jack to actually monitor what you're hearing. Um, with in the exception, real time. In real time. With the exception of the MV88, which is the only iOS only microphone we have, just basically due to that lightning connector right there, but very powerful piece as well. Um, and let's run through the lineup real quick. Yeah. So, uh, we've got the MVL, the, MVL. The, Motive, the Motive Lavalier, which is the 3.5 
Eighth inch, plug right in, very nice lab for mobile devices. And you had a little bit earlier the MVI, the yes. single channel interface. Single channel interface, which supplies phantom power. So any microphone that you own, or, you know, your favorite Shure mic or any microphone, you could plug into here, get a digital connection right to your device. And we've got, so what we're using here today is the MV5C, which actually was uh, basically added Mm -hmm. in response the to the work from home need. Uh, we're gonna be talking to Mike Cromer in a little bit. He's got the, kind of the MV5 classic. Yes. <laughs> or the original <laughs> version. So we're gonna talk to Mike about how he uses it both for work from home and perform from home. Mm -hmm. We've got the MV51. Uh, and we've kind of put these next to the, they're inspired by kind of classic Shure mics. We're gonna talk to Michael Pedersen about uh, some of where these mics come from. Uh, but the MV51, very similar to the MV5, a little more control on the front panel, kind of like an MV5 and an MVI. Yeah, if you notice, you have an MV5, and really what we did is we took the microphone portion out of the MV5, and we just kept it as the DSP setting. So you have five separate DSP settings on the MV1, MVI, and MV51. You have a setting for music, you have a setting for guitars, uh, loud playback, flat, and of course, spoken word. And of course, you have volume control for your mic gain, you have volume control for your headphone gain, and of course, your monitor mix and a mute button. So they kind of give you all the tools that you need to sound good right out the chute. And again, just a couple of the little differences. So the MV88 and the 88 Plus mini stereo shotgun microphones, yep. as opposed to the MV5 and MV51 single cardioid microphone elements. <laughs> Uh, the MV7, also a, a single element microphone, but the first to offer sound isolation. Sound isolation technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Very um, important. That, that's going to come up today. That's going to come up. The MV7 and sound isolation technology. Yes. Uh, more on that in a little bit. Yes, sir. Um, but, but without further ado, that was a, a very quick and general overview of the Motive line. We are going to get into some uh, Made with Motive. Exactly. Nice, Justin. Oh, can we get an exact? There we go. There we go. <laughs> we got to shake the rust off the production team with the, uh, with the exactly cues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to get more into each Motive mic individually in just a little bit. But we want to talk to Michael Pedersen really about the story of the SM7B. Definitely. I mean, this, this has been really a phenomenon at Shure. The microphone is coming up on 50 years old, but the popularity, I'd say from years one to 40-ish, relatively steady, the popularity in the last 10 or 12 years is like a rocket ship. Astronomical. Yeah. It is quite amazing that a mic that was developed in 1973 is where it is today, and we really haven't changed anything on it. It's, it's quite remarkable. And you see the MV7 obviously inspired by the SM7B. So we want to tell the story of the SM7B and its history, which really encompasses the history of Shure microphones over the last 75 plus years. Yeah. So let's get over to Michael. Michael, can you hear us? I can indeed, guys. Welcome Thank to Gear Talk. Hey, talking Thank to you. you so much. Appreciate that. Good to see you. Thank uh, you. We, we just want to start off a little bit, introduce you to our audience. You are the Shure Historian. Uh, what is the history of the Shure Historian at Shure? When did you start? <laughs> I started at Shure at October 10th, 1976. Uh, I came in as what's called a sales trainee, and that was basically training me to become a regional sales manager. So and I did. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and when, you, when you made the jump to regional sales manager, where did they send you? Uh, I had uh, territories, interesting, I kind of made a U around the United States. I had Boston, Atlanta, Dallas, and Southern California, Los <laughs> Angeles. Yeah. Kind of hit you on both ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did a lot of traveling back then. Yeah, uh, did, did you try to time your Southern California responsibilities for that January, February, rather than Boston, per se? Uh, you know, I, I grew up in the Midwest, and uh, you know, the winter doesn't really bother me, as long as, long as it you know, the cold is okay. You just got to have the right clothes. And the, the, only, the only thing is you know, when it gets icy and dangerous to drive, then that's a drag. But 
no, I just kind of went when we needed to go. <laughs> You're talking to a couple of Southern California lifetime natives. So we, we really yeah. don't know what winter is. We understand winter is coming as this like general idea that happens in other places in the world. <laughs> Very <laughs> but, true. But not to us. Yeah. Und understood. Understood. Yeah. <laughs> you, you moved from, from a sales manager into the product side. Yeah, I, I was really far more interested in developing products than I was in selling products. And so uh, around 1981, I became the product manager for what we called circuitry back then, which was our mixers, uh, particularly our, our automatic mixer was a brand new product. Uh, I remember my first day in the job, they put this big file in front of me and said, well, here's an automatic mixer project coming up. And I said, what's an automatic mixer? I had <laughs> absolutely no idea. But the, the products I brought out during my time there was a, we had our FP line, our field production line of products, oh, yeah. our AMS, our automatic microphone system, and some of our M-series mixers as well. So that was, you know, I did that for about 10 years. Were those the, the forebearers to our current Intellimix suite of products? Yep. We first used the term Intellimix. It was actually a, a name that I thought up one day, just kind of jotting down ideas. It was used on the FP410, which was our first actually the world's first portable automatic mixer. Uh, then it got used for the SCM810, and then now we use it for a variety of things. So I think we first used that term around 1989. So hold on real quick. You made up the term in Telemix. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's used and... across how many products today? Yeah, and uh, you, you see the big raise I got for that. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, is that the 1540s you got on right now? Is that was that when yeah, we came no, out with the Telemix room? <laughs> actually, when, when you started, sure, when you were for a manufacturer, one of the things they do, I, I don't know if they still do it, but when I started there, you had to sign a document that said anything that you invent while working there that has this related to the company belongs to the company. You know, that's like patents and so forth. Uh -huh. And then they paid you one dollar, a dollar bill, and then you had to sign a, a, a document. I still have that document because it was signed by Mr. Schur. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. And, <laughs> and and when did when would you say you, you started taking on maybe unofficially at first some of the historian type responsibilities, or is that just the role you came to naturally? Yeah, it was in the, it was in the nineties. I just I was interested in the products and uh Around 1995, I, I know, I said, well, let's see, 2000 is going to be our 75th anniversary. And I wrote a memo to Mrs. Shure saying, you know, our 75th anniversary is coming up. Why don't we put out a little 20-page pamphlet about the history of the company? Well, she thought that was a really good idea. So we started working on it. Well, seven years later, it took us a little bit longer than we expected. The 20-page document had turned into a two-volume, 400-page <laughs> history of Shure. So... <laughs> That's when I really started to get interested in it and then continued on. And, and then uh, one of my mentors was a guy named Don Gale, who he retired. And he had kind of put together the the archives, but it was really just a dusty closet uh, in our Evanston facility. When we moved to Niles, we actually built an archive and it kind of grew from there. So I was always interested in it. Um, I'd like to know where things come from. Uh -huh. And it was in around 2016 when Chris Shavink took over as our new president. And uh, I was actually getting ready to retire. Um, and she said, you know, you've got way too much knowledge for that. How would you like to be, <laughs> how would you like to be the corporate historian? And I said, great. Sounds wonderful to me. So if you look at my card that says director of corporate history, and then one added line, which I put on there, it just says sage. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I, I imagine of those of those two volumes, there, there must have been quite quite a bit of time dedicated to the Unidyne and, and Ben Bauer in, in the late 30s there. There was indeed. Uh, unfortunately, I never knew Ben. I do know his sons. Um, and I do know a lot of the Bauer family. By the way, if you remember the Bauer family and you don't have at least five degrees, including one PhD, you don't belong part of, the, part of that family. It's <laughs> That's just, just table it's stakes. Just the, <laughs> it's just the highest performing intelligent family I've ever met in my life. But unfortunately, I never knew Ben. But part of my kind of goal I've done is just trying to make sure that we all remember Ben again, because he was so influential for the pro audio industry in general, and particularly for sure. Right. And, you know, one of the things uh, to, to help with that recognition, uh, I, I know you have a, a, a fond 
uh, understanding of the significance of the IEEE award, the milestone award given to yeah. the Unidyne. Uh, can, yeah. you, can you tell our audience what that award was in recognition of? Uh, yeah. So the IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, wide worldwide organization, I think they have, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of members, but they have this program called the Milestone Award. And they've given out a, over a little over 200 Milestone Awards, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in since they started the program about 50 years ago. So in 2014, they gave Shure a milestone award for the development of the Unidyne microphone. The Unidyne microphone was Ben Bauer's invention, came out in 1939. That's the Elvis mic there, Ross, you can see it if you want to just point it out, there you go. <laughs> um, and what was cool, I mean, it was a great honor for us, but then when we started looking at other honors that were given, so they do, they do these by decades, so I won't list them all, but from the 1930s, for example, there was a milestone award for the breaking of the Enigma code during World War II. Um, there was the uh, for Claude Shannon's development of information theory by Bell Labs, which has basically <laughs> laid the whole thing for like, um, you know, for the whole digital age, uh -huh. but also the work of Nikola Tesla, um, the invention of the internet, the Apollo 11 program, those all got milestone awards as did the Unidyne. So it's a great neighborhood to live in. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you look back, through the decades, they are sort of the defining technologies that, that came to build the modern world. And, and the yep. Unidyne is right there, de deservedly so. It is, it is indeed. So yeah, we're quite proud of that. We're, we're sort of starting at the very beginning, which is exactly yep. what we wanted to do. And, and we know where we're getting, the SM7B, but can you talk to us a little bit about what the original Unidyne 1 and then the Unidyne 2 allowed users of those microphones uh, what problems they solved now that yep. the Unidyne element was in place. So 23 year old Ben Benjamin Baumsweiger, as he was originally <clears throat> called, came to work at Schur in 1936. And one of the first projects he was put on is that Mr. Schur said, can we figure out how to make a directional microphone using just one element? They wanted to make a cardioid microphone with one element. Now you could do a cardioid microphone before that, but you'd have to have a bi-directional and an omnidirectional in one housing and then combine them electronically to get the cardioid pattern. It was expensive. So Ben's working on this, and at age 24, he comes up with what's called the uniphase acoustical network, which is basically what's going on inside that microphone to make it directional. Um, without going into a lot of details, there's some, there's some little chambers in there, there's labyrinths, there's materials in there that slow the sound down. It's very complicated. The math is completely beyond me. But basically, he came up with a way to take a single element, originally a crystal element, by the way, and then moved on to the dynamic of the moving coil and turned it into a microphone that was sensitive to the front, kind of sensitive from the sides, and hardly sensitive at all from the back, a cardioid-shaped pattern. So that was introduced in uh, March of 1939 wow. at, a, at a price of, in today's prices, is about $835. So it was not an inexpensive mic. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yep. But... Took the world by storm. I mean, it's, it's a cool looking mic too. I mean, everybody loves the way it looks. Uh, inspired, by the way, by the front end of a 1937 Oldsmobile. If you ever look up a 37 Oldsmobile, you'll see that you see that microphone staring at you. Which is so great. It's got that kind of classic feel back when, when even your automobile was sort of a work of art in a way. And yep. that kind of translated down into the microphone. And it became an on-camera piece of hardware, right? I mean, it was sitting right on the desk for for any sort of film or television production. So it, yep. it had to look the part. Yep. So yeah, so in 12 years from 1939 to 1951, it became really ubiquitous. You can see it in all kinds of films. You can see it in all kinds of historical things. Uh, the famous Dewey defeats Truman uh, photograph. There's a mi microphone there. Uh, you can see General MacArthur speaking into it. So it was used everywhere. But late 40s, early 50s, television comes along and says to sure, that yeah, microphone's too big, covers up too much of the face. Can you make a smaller version of it? And so there we go. Zach's pointing to the 55S. S simply stands for small. And it's about 66% the size of the Unidyne one. And so in 1951, that's the size we started to make. And it quickly replaced the Unidyne one, the larger one. Itself. So the big one's Unidyne one, small one is Unidyne two. We still make the Unidyne two even today uh, in the Super 55 and also the 55SH series too. And then, so 
basically the Unidyne 2 holds true to the Unidyne 1 smaller, but the Unidyne 3, really the, the parent of things like the SM57, the right. SM58, and the SM7B. I think most people assume yep. the 57 and 58 are related, but might be surprised to learn that the SM7B is part of that same family tree. What changed with the Unidyne 3 that led to these the next wave of iconic Shure microphones. So Ben had started working on the Unidyne 3 in the mid 50s. And uh, a guy named Ernie Seeler came to work at Shure. He was relatively new. Uh, and Ben took him under his wing and started teaching Ernie. So Ernie, basically, Ben left Shure in 1958. And Ernie in 1959 brings out the Unidyne 3, which is basically a, a cylindrical microphone that you speak into the end of it as opposed to the side. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it turns out there's a lot of good reasons to have an end fire microphone, particularly because the polar pattern is uniform no matter how you rotate that microphone. And that basically means when you're using it in a sound reinforcement system, you can turn it up. It can be louder. <laughs> gotcha. More game. And think about what's happening. Right. And think what's happening in the 50s and 60s. Rock and roll is starting to happen. And now musicians want to move around the stage. If you think about singers in the 40s, there's this microphone on a stand, they walk up to do it, they sing, they walk away. And that's because they had placed that microphone in just the right spot so it wouldn't feed back. So don't move it. Right. But now <laughs> Elvis Presley comes around, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis comes around, they want to dance around the stage. And all of a sudden, that idea of a fixed microphone is out the window. You know, Dying 3 happened to be the right time at the right place, and it was the right tool. And quickly, in the early 60s, started to be adopted by rock and roll. So cool. Just, just a reminder, everybody, get your questions in the chat. We're going to get those queued up. We're going to open up the Q&A in a few minutes. But we're right at this really fun point in history, right, moving into the 60s when we've got the SM56, the 57, the 58, Jimi Hendrix, Monterey Pop, uh, all of the kind of iconic rock and roll stars of the day. But right alongside that path is the SM5. It wasn't the SM7 yet. It was the SM5. Uh, we can we can leave the the rich history of the fifty seven and fifty eight maybe for another day. What sure. happened with the SM five uh, right in that time frame? Well, sure was trying to crack into the studio market, which would be TV, radio, and film studios. Uh, and so we had taken microphones that we already had and basically gave them a great a great coating so they wouldn't reflect light. Put it on XLR connectors. Did a variety of things to make them appropriate for studios. One of the mics we brought out was an SM5, and the SM5 was a microphone designed to go at the end of a boom to do booming on TV shows and then film sets. And so it had, uh, it had a Unidyne 3 element inside and then two really, really large foam windscreens on both ends. Uh, it, looked, it, it was about the size of a football, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so we were trying to you say, oh, this is a great boom mic. Well, it was a very good microphone, except being a dynamic, it didn't have a very high output level. And that was a problem, because when you're booming, you're booming people from three or four feet away, you need a lot of gain. Microphone didn't have that. So it was never really too successful. Uh, except then, radio studios started to say, wow, I wonder if that makes a good on-air mic. And so they started using it for on-air microphones. Now, when you're talking the microphone from an inch away, you don't have the problem with gain. You got plenty of gain and gain in that case. So the SM5 kind of developed this following amongst uh, FM stations and AM stations as a really, really good on-air microphone. The problem is there's only so many radio stations. <laughs> and once they buy their SM5s, they don't need to buy anymore. So it really never was a very big seller for us. Well, you, you guys build the microphone that, that doesn't fail. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. If it just right. lasts forever. I, I right. love that that community embraced it because let's be honest, when you're a radio host, what's the phrase? A face for radio. You're, how you sound <laughs> is, huge. Right. is what is critical. And so that's a discerning audience when they standardize on a microphone like that. Right. So the SM5, we, we introduced it in 64. We discontinued it in 1988. And it never sold more than a couple hundred units a year. Think about that. A couple, you know, a couple of hundred. It's just not a big seller. Yet, yet all 200 probably came up to you at NAB to ask, where's my SM5? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> for, for dec it seems like for decades and for decades, you know, we, we were told that. So uh, in the late 60s, the SM5 wasn't doing very well. It was kind of large. And there was a demand really for a voiceover microphone that kind of had that same sound, but smaller. And so in 16, 1969, we started working on the SM7. So the SM7 had the same type of yoke uh, as the uh, SM5, 
Uh, it had an internal shock mount that was based upon our A55M rubber donut. There you go. Had a Unidyne 3 element inside it. Basically, it's an SM57 with some extended low end and a different diaphragm on it as well. And uh, we brought it out and in, uh, introduced it end of 1972 and sold the first ones in 1973. So kind of November, December, the, the announcement goes out, first units shipping in 73. Well, it was a modest success. Um, there was all, it, you know, it was used for voiceover, but it also found its way into studios. It was been used by uh, Mick Jagger for recording for many, many years. Michael Jackson, famous thriller album, he always uses it as well. So from 1973 to around 2008, it sold pretty good. But it wasn't great. It was no SM58. It was no SM57. Right. And it's hard to be judged on the curve at that time because <laughs> pretty good is one thing. But while the 58 and the 57 are, are wild successes, I imagine there might have been some conversations internally like, well, it's, it's no 58. But, but let's right. stick with it, right? Exactly. Because it was filling a niche and it was good enough to continue to manufacture, but it was not what we would call a hit. It's just one of those average Joe, you know, it's, it's like the baseball player gets a single every now and then. And we'll, we'll just let him continue on. Gotcha. Um, we did make a couple changes, though. Uh, in 1999, we added a better humbucking coil. There had always been a humbucking coil in there, but we made it a more improved one. And that was to reduce hum that was happening in radio studios because the microphones were being used close to CRT monitors. And cathode ray tube monitors have a tendency to have a magnetic field around them. So the microphones will have them. So we improved that. And then in uh, two, three years later, in 2000, you know, two years later, in 2001, we added the big windscreen. Now, I don't know if you guys have the bigger windscreen there. So when you buy an SM7B now, you get the windscreen that's on the mic that you've got, and then a much larger windscreen that you can put on in place. And that much larger windscreen, by purpose, was made to look like an SM5. <laughs> so, so they'd stop it, bothering you at, at NAB. You can, hey, at least we got the windscreen knows, for you. Exactly. And you know something? It worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny and how that always ends up happening. <laughs> isn't that the case? So, so you know, people were, were seeing, hearing with their eyes, if you will. So, Michael, you don't have to look into the SM7B much to find people online saying, you know what? You really should pair it with something like like a cloud lift, like a CL1, mm -hmm. yep. uh, something to give it a little boost. It, it can be described as a gain hungry kind of microphone. Uh, that's not a, a flaw. That, that is really just because of the design of the microphone and the setting it's being used. Uh, it need, can, can you walk us through why yep. there's a, yep. a bit of a lower output? So there's a, it's a dynamic mic. So how do you increase the output of a dynamic microphone? Well, you can put more windings in the voice coil, which we already did. Um, you can put an output transformer to boost it up. It does not have an output transformer in it, and that's to help reduce hum when it's in the hum field as well. But when it came out in the 70s, having 60, 70, 80 dB a gain in your mic preamplifier was very, very common. That was not a problem back then. Then what you had happen is, is particularly low, lower cost condenser microphones came out in the 80s and 90s. And now you can build 20 dB a gain into the preamp of the microphone. Mixer manufacturers started dropping that 20 dB of gain out of their mixers. Uh, you know, first of all, a little bit cheaper. Second of all, made the mixer quieter and so forth. And they were relying upon the microphone to have that 20 dB of gain. Uh, so that's why people think that, oh, gee, it's really kind of needs gain hungry. Actually, if you get a decent mic preamp, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's got that gain in it. It's really not an issue. So it's not a flaw. It's just there's a dynamic microphone. Dynamic microphones by physics have a output that is limited. Uh, and, you know, there, there really was a change in the way that mixers were made as opposed to anything wrong with the microphone. But, you know, based on the current sales, I don't think it bothers too many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually a good question. Um, so it was released in 1973. Yep. Uh, you fast forward to 2021, yep. let's say uh, the amount of microphones that we've sold from 73 to 2008 was a finite amount. And from right. 2008 million, to 221, million, what are we looking up, at? Yeah. So, you know, from that 35 years up 10 percent, down 10 percent, just was just, you know, just steady. And then in 2008, podcasters got a hold of this. And I don't know how they found it, but somehow they found it. And they started telling other podcasters. And of course, the word gets out on the web and then it starts to go up like really fast. 
and then gamers around 2014 or 2015 started buying it. Yeah, I mean, I see it on every Twitch channel, on every live stream. I mean, it, it is its popularity yep. has just skyrocketed. Yep. It's and then we get 2020. Now people want to sound like a radio announcer at home and so forth. So the the curve that started at 2008, well, I guess here's the easiest way to look at it. If you look at how many we're selling in, in, in the past year, 2020, versus how many we sold in 2000, it's about 100 times greater. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right. It's just, you know, I mean, for, for us, it really, we had to increase manufacturing lines. And imagine going back to your suppliers because we have to buy things for purposes. Yeah, you know, yeah, Joe, I know we bought a million last year, but could, could you give us five million this year? You know, the suppliers go, what? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, right. So, you know, that's. That, we're we're yeah. gonna we're gonna get to some questions here. Sure. Um, we like to play a game here on Gear Talk. What the spec? Talking gear. <laughs> what, <laughs> what the spec? What the spec? So you know we're we're trying to focus on one thing. You, you get a spec sheet and it's got a lot of detail in there. And I think for a lot of people, their eyes tend to glaze over when they see all those numbers and graphs and whatnot. Yep. Sure. Um, and and we were just talking about the output of the SM7B. Can you talk to us about what a mic sensitivity rating tells you and why yep. a number like minus fifty nine dbv is is important on the sm7b yeah it, it, it's really confusing to the average person so the dbv it's the simplest way to think about this is what this one volt peak to peak signal is zero dbv so if you have a signal level that's above one volt it's going to be a plus number and if you have a signal that's below one volt it's going to be a minus number so okay. if one zero db is one minus 20 happens to be 0.1 volt Minus 40 happens to be 0 0.0 volt. Minus 60 happens to be 0 0.001 volt. You can see every every time you drop down 20, it moves to the right one, the, one decimal. So there always be one one place. So uh, I think the output of the SM59 is like minus. Excuse me, the SM7 is minus 59 dBV. Yeah. So yeah. So that's going to be somewhere between 0 0.001 volt and 0 0.0001 volt. So you know, it's basically one one millivolt approximately. And if you're but, comparing two microphones and you put an equal loudness source into each microphone and one has a 5 dB hotter sensitivity, like a 58 versus a SM7B, then we would expect that out for the same input source, that output signal would be, that's the difference we're going to see on a meter right. on our console. Yep. And what's, what's confusing to the poor consumer is that a microphone with a minus 59 output is not as loud as a microphone with a minus 55 output. Because you know people say, well, fifty nine is higher than 50, <laughs> 55. Yeah, but it's minus. Right. So you know, so let's go back to winter. Minus fifty nine is colder than minus fifty five. <laughs> right. Very Wait, true. You lost us again when you started talking yeah, about winter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Let, let's ask you some questions before we get out of here. I know one we're we're curious about internally at Audio Gear. Definitely. Your your Desert Island uh, Sure product. The one, if you had one to carry with you. For, for the rest of your life, but it could only be one. Is it is it that F, FP410, the kind of you pick from any era in Shure history? Uh, what's that Shure product? It can't live with that. Well, I mean, if, if I did it simply for appearance, it would be the Unidine just because it's so cool. But if I did it for utility, it'd be an SM57. I mean, could, you can use a 57. Swiss Army knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and you mic anything with a 57, it's going to sound good. So, yeah, probably a 57. Guys, what do we got for Michael? Okay, oh, I got one. Um, yep. Was there any products in the Sure family that were almost discontinued that would have been uh, not the right move? <laughs> yeah. How about the 57 and the 58? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they were not hits when they came out. Um, you have to realize in the 60s, we were making so much money with phonograph cartridges. Just you know, everybody needed phonograph cartridges. And so the microphones were really getting short shrifted a little bit. So it was around 1970, the micro 57, 58 had been out for four or five years and they were not making sales forecast. And the vice president of sales called the meeting and just said, I think it's time to get rid of these because they're not doing well. So uh, it turns out they had a meeting and uh, our sales manager at the time, a guy named Roger Ponto said, well, you know, these things, maybe these things are good for sound reinforcement. Let me take a bunch of them out to Las Vegas. There's a lot of, you know, theaters out there and see how well they do out there. And of course they did very well. So by the skin of our teeth, we did not discontinue the SM57 and the SM58. Wow. Imagine if we did. <laughs> oh man. Hey, we didn't even ask. Um, Mike, what, what are you using for a microphone right now? 
I am using an MV7. Oh, awesome. You sound yep. you sound excellent. That's why I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, it's, it's, it's the silver one. Okay. Which makes no difference whatsoever, but basically it's a silver one. I've been using it actually since March. I had a prototype. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it works, works great. Yeah, no, because um, I actually found the best mic stand ever for an MV7. It's a voice-activated mic stand. So I could just well, call it into the shop. Yeah, so MV7, <laughs> come down. I see. see oh, that? man. I mean, that's it a, works that's... perfectly. Wow, yeah. man. And then, of course, I could be like, you know, all right, I'm done. But problem is, is my mic stand's probably on back order, and it's very high-end and expensive. Um, you know, so, oh, wait a minute. Anyways, uh, just wanted to say thanks, man. Wanted to say thanks for having, a, having you. <laughs> wanted to say thanks for all the great information. We would love you to come back to Gear Talk in a future episode. Uh, I'd be happy go to do over that. a couple other things, man. So I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. You're welcome. Glad to, <laughs> glad to do it. Oh. Definitely. That was very informative. Um, and in the meantime, um, we are going to go through the nuts and bolts of the MV7 because we're going to jump right into it. Uh, so wanted to jump into the MV7. Uh, it is our only motive microphone that does have two separate outputs. You have your XLR output. You also have your USB output. You also have a headphone monitoring jack here as well. Um, on the front panel controls itself, uh, you do have quite a few different controls here. Uh, you do have... Right now we are locked, so I'm gonna unlock this bad boy. And what you have is you have basically your mic gain. Oh, I am in auto mode. So let me change it to manual mode real quick. You'll see that we change it to manual. Now I actually have control of my front panel controls. So I have a slide bar here. If I'm in green, I will be adjusting my mic gain. I tap this button right here to change to my headphone level. So in orange, it will be my headphone level. And then of course I have a mute button right here as well, which will engage the mute. As you can tell, red light will illuminate on the mic itself. Uh, we do have auto and manual mode on this, uh, on this microphone. And of course, when you set to auto level, I'm sorry, let me back up. On the manual mode, we do have a couple other fine tuned adjustments that you have. You also have your EQ. Um, so you have flat, presence peak, and a roll off. And then of course, presence peak and roll off together. We do have compression as well. Um, light, medium, and hard compression. You do have a built-in limiter. Um, but me personally, when I use this thing at home, what I like to do is I just like to set it to auto mode. So I really don't have to f really kind of think about anything. Uh, when I have it to auto mode, it does disengage all of these controls here, so I won't be able to adjust anything. Um, now I do have a monitor mix. Now there's two separate settings on the auto mode, whether you're gonna have the microphone near as I have it right now or far. Far roughly is about 18 inches at your max distance. Near, you roughly wanna be about six inches apart. And then we have three separate tonal characteristics in the auto mode. We have dark, natural, and bright, of course. Uh, but great microphone, um, sells for 249. And uh, we're gonna jump into it a little bit more with uh, an interview with one of our gentlemen that we're gonna call in over from Las Vegas. So just wanted to uh, make sure you guys knew the nuts and bolts of this before we jumped into it. All right, and I do wanna mention once again, sound isolation technology. It's a big thing with the MV7. And of course, we'll go into it with a little bit more detail as soon as we head over to Daryl. Is Daryl in there? Yep, I'm here, hey guys. Hey, there hey, he is. Hey, Daryl. How you doing? Good, good to see you, sir. Daryl, thanks for joining Gear Talk. Hey, well, thanks for having me. I'm uh, live in the Las Vegas Strip, right in front of the uh, beautiful Bellagio. Awesome. And, uh, Nice sunny day. Yay. Yeah, we, we hear <laughs> birds chirping. The sun is out. This is this is about as scenic as it gets for Vegas. Oh, uh, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's nice. It's it's a, a little chilly today, but uh, it's an awesome place. And, of course, the Strip's always crazy. There's lots going on and music and all sorts of things. So, actually, this is a great place to test out this microphone. <laughs> yeah, that, that sound isolation is is working pretty well. Um, I, I, it's I, pretty I, amazing, yeah. Yeah, we, we just hear, I, I mean really the faintest of background noise we hear you great oh cool so how you guys doing today can't complain you know we're awesome. on gear yeah, you have all the all the uh all, yeah, exactly you have all the uh the sure mic candy in front of you i'm, I'm like okay i want the red one i want the blue one <laughs> <laughs> definitely uh we're, we're know, not right? quite set up yet on gear talk to take orders 
Uh, oh, okay. But, well. but we can certainly help you out. Uh, be, besides uh, the vintage ones, which are absolutely not ours to give away. <laughs> I know. Those are so gorgeous. Yeah. Iconic, the iconic sure bikes. Daryl, you're, you're sort of a, a, a man with many expertise. Uh, you, you start, can you just run us, you know, it's probably hard for you to start at the very beginning, but, but where did you get your start in, in live sound, production? Uh, you're a performer. You're a, a back of house kind of guy. Where, where do you want to start with your history? Yeah, I've kind of, you know, I've kind of worn many hats, like many musicians and creatives. So, um, way back when, I started playing guitar and singing. You know, probably in junior high school. So, and then when I got into high school, we talked a little bit about uh, the other day. Um, I was actually a sound guy for our our high school in, in uh, Huntington Beach. I was a sound guy for the theater. And, uh, you know, started using the, all the, uh, of course, the 58s, the 57s, uh, Unisphere B going even way back to, to the 70s. And, uh, yeah, that, and I, I'm a stage hand, uh, an A2 audio, assistant audio guy at the MGM for many years. Um, I'm a bass player, was with Cirque du Soleil for 10 years. Um, yeah, you know, just, it's like, it's a, it's kind of a long mishmash of, of multiple jobs. I guess I get bored or I have ADD, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, Sounds like you're yeah, busy though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you know, that's the thing. And, and I think part of being creative, uh, being a creative guy or, or in, that, in that world is, is reinvention. Um, and that's actually how I got into podcasting, which has been my most recent uh, adventure. And that's part of how we met. Um, because the Motive series for podcasting uh, works awesome. The USB uh, component, these MV7s are awesome because you have the XLR and the USB components. So that really has helped me expand on what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, and I'm excited to see what uh, what new product sure comes out with also for uh, for Motive, for, for podcasting and all that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you actually got started with the one of the first Motive microphones, the MV88. You know, for such right. a long history in kind of the analog world, what was it like to kind of embrace life with an MV88 plugged into a smartphone as a as a production tool? Well, I'll tell you what's amazing. So I do, uh, we have, uh, we, actually we're on live on one of our music pages right now based in Guitar Love. Um, but I, we do a lot of live streaming on those pages and having a, a, a mobile uh, high quality stereo microphone that you can plug into your phone and, and you don't have to think about it. It's just, you know, with the with the, the technology, as far as the app that's related, you can set your know, limiter compression. So when you go live, you're not having to worry about distortion or anything like that. The quality is so high. I also have the MV8 Plus kit for uh, for phones. And yeah, for, for live streaming, I mean, it's amazing. And the sound quality is, it's literally like, you know, we did some tests and it almost sounds like you're in the studio. It's actually pretty amazing. And that's so, kind of awesome. what we were trying to, you know, capture with this Motive line was giving you that studio quality sound kind of right. anywhere that you're going to be able to go. Yeah, and for creators, you know, that's the thing. Last thing you want to worry about is the gear. You want to have the gear working, having it sound awesome, and then you can focus on on what you're trying to capture. And that's the great thing about the Motive line because everything is, is just plug and play. It's easy. Um, you have the app. You can fine tune audio, fine tune compression, limiting, that kind of thing. But the, having the ease of use is super important, and I think that's what they've achieved with this product line. Yeah, and, and is that, I imagine, you know, the Music Matters podcast, there's probably not a team of, of eight or ten people around you, right? Is it, is it pretty much the, the less you have to focus on gear, the more you can focus on being the host? Right, exactly. Yeah, I think, again, it's like the plug-and-play aspect. And also, you know, with, what's awesome about this MV7 and the USB, being able to just plug directly into your laptop or your desktop, is you don't have to have an interface. You don't have to go out and buy other gear, and it's simple, like you said, I'm basically like a one-man show for the most part. I have my producer, um, Nigel, in France that, that he helps me with my production. And uh, if, yeah, it's just nice to be able to know that you're going to get good quality sound that you can focus on the guest, which is the most important part. So. Yeah, we want you focusing on creating the content, not worrying about exactly. The yeah, then that's 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 what we're you know as creators and, and content creators, that's exactly what we're focused on. So, Justin, exactly. give, give Daryl an exactly. Can can we do? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that that was a natural uh, gear talk guest using exactly in context. I like it. Uh, <laughs> Daryl, awesome. not not to drill you about the about the MV7, but are you kind of an auto mode guy or a manual mode? Do you like to get in there and tweak some settings, or is it pretty much Auto mode helps me, even though you know what a compressor is and how to EQ a mic. But if auto mode well, can I'll help I'll tell you, you the, right, the auto mode um, 
actually works amazing. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's different components you can tweak. For me, I'm in a studio environment generally, you know, obviously today I'm outside, but um, auto mode's great because you don't have to worry again about compression, limiting. You get a nice uh, fat sound as everybody can even hear now what I'm doing. It, this mic sounds awesome. Yeah, and, um, and I gotta say, yeah. I gotta hit on it one more time. You're on the Las Vegas Strip. There's so right. much stuff going around. There's tons We're of cars going by. <laughs> any of that background noise. So it's really honing in on that voice isolation technology that's built right into that MV7. Yeah, and it's honestly, it's amazing. Like, I'm not just saying that. Like, I, I love the products. I'm a big fan of Sure and have been for many years. But it's such a great tool for creators. All of these, this whole motive line is, is smartly designed. It's, it's made for ease of use, which is super, you know, it's super important and they're affordable, which yeah. is the other part of it. The MV88, the MV88 Plus, all that stuff is is within most people's price range. But the MV7, which also like, again, you don't have to have an interface. So you don't need, to, you know, you can, you can use the XLR, you can do that too as an option, but you don't have to. And that's a great, for creators who are on a budget, people that want to have create high quality content, that's super important. So. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and Daryl, you were kind enough to uh, record a short clip of you playing bass using the uh, the MV88 Plus. Let's check that right. out real quick. Okay. It's with my green strings. <laughs> I like them. <laughs> Had you done a recording with the MV88 Plus right on your bass cab like that before? I've actually, I've been recording some local uh, singer songwriters in Vegas using that microphone. And I hadn't, that's the first time I've used it for bass. And actually, as you can hear on the demo, like it sounds huge. And that's just plug and play, like put it in front of the cab and go. Not No EQ needed, nothing, nothing, you know, it's in auto mode. So it sounds great. You we, know, I was actually, I was, when I listened back, I was like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> we we, so we should cool. say that was about 0.01% of, of Daryl's bass playing capabilities. <laughs> well, I, I've been, known, I've been known to overplay with the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we were happy to hear you. You were gigging this weekend. So uh, you, you broke your, yeah. your, your streak of, of uh, no gigs for a series of months. So hopefully that is. Yeah. Signs and of actually optimism. I used, I used my MV88 plus uh, to film some of that. We were down in San Diego at a, at a casino my first gig since last March. So I'm hoping that, you know, all of us, obviously we want to get going and, and get in a post uh, post COVID world, I guess. And uh, so I think now is a great time to look at products and look at stuff that for, for creating content. Um, and it's good to do research and learn about the products. What you guys are doing here today is awesome when you're explaining things in depth, because a lot of people see these products on, on different, you know, retail sites and they're not exactly sure what they do <laughs> or how they function. <laughs> so that's, a, it's an important component to say, Hey, this is what it does. This is for, this is, this is for this use. This is for that use. And it's super important. So. Awesome. Well, awesome. thank you, Daryl. We, we really appreciate it. We're going to see a little bit more from you later uh, in the episode, but we'll let you go from here before no, none of the Las Vegas authorities find you uh, <laughs> in your pirate radio broadcast here. Yes, I, I got to go do my gambling. So. <laughs> there you go. Really appreciate you coming down, man. Awesome, guys. Thanks, nice Dale. nice Take to care. see you. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Well, that was really slick. Yeah, we, we love talking to Daryl. He's a, he's yeah. a Friend of the show. The show's been around long enough. We've got friends of the show now. Yes, we do. Um, okay, we're going to get into our Prove It, Let's Do It. Prove It, Let's Do It. Uh, this time, we're going to do it hashtag made with motive. Yes. That's how you can tell the generation we're from is we say the hashtag. Do we, <laughs> or are we just supposed to say made with motive? No, hashtag made with motive. Okay, we, we, we need a, um, a social media tutorial. So we are going to change Prove It, Let's Do It a little bit today. Right. Usually we would do prove it, let's do it here in the right. studio setting. But due to the pandemic and the work from home, play from home aspect of the show, uh, we we're planning to do something a little bit different this time. We're not playing, basically. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk to Mike Cromer. Mike, can you hear us? How are you doing? I can hear you. I'm doing good. Thanks. Hey, Mikey. Awesome. Mike is joining us from the home office. Mike, which mode of microphone are you talking to us on? I am using an MV5. And um, I've made a, a slight adjustment here, modification. I, I purchased a $15 uh, broadcast boom stand from Amazon. And so I can just sort of stick it on here. I can swing it out of the way, get it out of the shot if need be. Or um, when I'm doing something else, you can kind of change the angle and, and whatnot. So I, I really like it. Awesome. And what were you using before you got an MV5? Uh, before for uh, video conferencing, I was just using the the microphone built into the laptop, uh, which I think we can all sort of a, 
sort of attest to bad audio out there in the uh, in the world, even on national broadcasts, TV shows. So um, I updated probably I don't know three months ago from the the computer sound. Nice. Cool. Can we hear what you would have sounded like uh, three months ago? Yes. Now? Let me. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Let me switch. So you're hearing my laptop. Wow. Sound right now. The, the microphone just out of laptop, and it probably sounds like you know, half the calls you're on throughout the day or throughout the week. And I will switch it to the MV5. This is the MV5 wow. now. Yeah. Got... Nice moment of relief once you get back into that good sounding audio. Yeah. I I got to the point where I bought one for my son also who was, who was doing virtual school. He signed up for vir virtual school for the entire year. So um, I invested in a second one for the Cromer household. And it lives <laughs> at his... His classroom desk, we used to call it the living room, but um, it's turned into a classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I think you and everybody else in America. <laughs> yeah. um, so, hey, are you using the headphone output to monitor right now? I don't. I just use the speakers on my laptop. It seems to work fine. There's no interference or, you know, echo or anything like that. Um, I do use the headphone jack when I record uh, music. So I play guitar also, as you guys might know. And I'll use this just to record ideas, uh, either in in where my office is, or I've got a little studio set up out in the living room, and I'll just pick it up, plug it in, super quick, super easy. And I'll use a headphone jack there because uh, you don't hear any of the latency. Okay. Do you have a different setting for when you have it in front of your computer versus when you have it with your guitar? Yes. There's. You can actually set up presets. There's a similar app to what you showed for the Motive uh, MB7. Mm -hmm. And so I do have a, a setup that I've programmed in here, and you can actually switch on the back button. There's a mute and a, um, a uh, preset button that you can switch between on oh, the back. Sweet. So I've got it bumped a little bit in, in the sort of the mid and the bottom end and a little bit of compression. And then when I record, I just put it in the flat mode. Gotcha. It'd be really great. cool yeah. if we could hear him play guitar. Yeah, let's check thing. out a clip real quick. Wait, we have a clip? <laughs> I think so. Oh, I hope awesome. so. <laughs> a clip. <laughs> there's there's a delay on this end. Is it delayed on your end? Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I don't know what the delay was on your side. I'm going to chalk that up to the internet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I probably don't see it on my end. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thanks for joining Gear Talk. We're going to talk to Alan about the MV51. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, no problem. So that was the MV5, uh, but we want to go over to the MV51 yep. with our fearless leader, Alan Gear. Uh, the gear and audio gear. We're really happy. His first appearance here on Gear Talk. So, Alan, how you doing? I'm doing good. Happy to be here. Happy to be here on the show that bears my name for the first time. But that's a separate conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to Gear Talk. Welcome to Gear Talk. <laughs> Talking gear. Talking gear. Yeah, I, I. You know, we can always start the Alan Gear Gear Podcast series. Uh, <laughs> tale, tales from the territory. You know, don't don't rule that out. <laughs> I've got great tales. More <laughs> stories, yep. <laughs> uh, do we need a parental advisory sticker on your podcast series? Do you know me? You <laughs> probably do. Probably not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, we, we see the MV51 there. It looks great. Um, what were you using before you got the 51? I was using my laptop uh, microphone and speakers, which was, uh, you know, questionable. Can we can we hear what that would have sounded like? Uh, Alan on a oh. conference call circa 2018. <laughs> yes, uh, here we go. How's that? Oh, wow. That? I'm sorry, what now? That's yeah, a that's, huge that's, difference. That's what they were listening to. Let me switch back here. Okay, now we're back to the MV51. Is there any difference there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, yeah. You just about disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that without the MV51, you miss all the condescending tone of my of my voice, which is critical, right? That's right around <laughs> that that four to six k presence boost. That's right. That's where it comes from. <laughs> it's the condescending preset I have over here. <laughs> well, we're gonna get to presets. We're gonna get to presets. Uh, there, there's not a sarcasm dial on on the 51. Not not yet. Firmware update. Firmware update. Uh, They're all internal. I got them all. They're right over here. <laughs> Quick question. Um, I, I see that you're having it in your work from home setting. What setting are you using on the DSP? 
I'm using the uh, the the vocal chat one with a little call out bubble for speech. Oh, perfect. And obviously you got you got your SRH 1540s on, so you're using the headphone out to monitor as well. Uh, I am. What, what's it like controlling your headphone volume from the 51? You know, it's great. You know, frankly, when you're doing these conferences or whatever you might be recording with, to be able to just go up and go, I'm doing guitar. I need to hear it louder. Go. Or when you're on a conference call, right? Uh, I'm not loud enough. I'm too loud. Whatever that might be. Easy to control here. Uh, and I'll tell you, my favorite feature is the mute button. Because as you go from one software, you know, uh, interface to another, whether it's Teams or Zoom or what have you, um, where is that mute button? I don't know. Let me search. Guess what? It's always right there. It's got a nice red light. Alan knows where he is. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good place to be. <laughs> we, we got a clip of you using the 51 in your in your electric guitar uh, so. after oh, both before work hours and after work hours. That's kind of the hidden huh? secret about Alan is you can catch him practicing <laughs> scales and chords at about 4.30 a.m. in the office. I think, <laughs> Justin, let's let's see that early morning clip. Killer. Awesome. And you did that using using just your phone? Uh, MV51, right? And that's what I love about it. No matter where I put it, easy setup, sounds great, easy as can be. I did use the uh, Motive video app, uh, which interface is great, and through the 1540s, awesome, great setup. Awesome. What setting were you in it when you had it in front of the guitar amp? I had it on a little setting that has a little guitar on it. <laughs> Even a rep principal can do this, I swear. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Awesome. Well, boss, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Be well. Awesome. So we're, we're running real quick here. Mm -hmm. Let's get into Mike Gilliard because we've got to finish this up with the MV88 Plus and a drum track. A drum track. Let's go. Mike, how are you? Hey, guys. How you doing? Thanks for joining good, us. Man. The other yeah, face of me. audio gear on the internet, Mike Gilliard. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> so you got an MV88 Plus you're using right now to talk to us. I, yeah, that's correct. You awesome. sound amazing. Hey, thanks. <laughs> um, real quick, we want to check out a clip of you playing drums, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the settings you use for both recording, instrument, and talking. So that's it. Hang on one sec, Justin. Let's roll the clip. So one thing that's really cool, right, is that MV88 Plus gives you the flexibility to make that stereo image a little more broad or a little more narrow. Uh, Mike, what were you using when you recorded that drum track? Yeah, actually, so uh, the MV88, like you said, it's it's great because it has that stereo imaging. Um, I I used one of the presets that's available. There's there's five presets, so I used the the loud or band setting and uh, just dialed in some some EQ and compression to taste. Um, I think it was about a 120 degree spread on the uh, stereo spread, but yeah, it's just sounded great. Find a good position to put the mic and play. That's pretty much it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Sounded good. And when you come back and you're talking to us now, I imagine you got a different preset you use in kind of your work from home mode. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I use it for, uh, for in, in the speech preset, Yeah, much more narrow, uh, pick a pattern for my preference. I still like being in stereo. I just like the stereo image, even if it's a narrow pattern. Gotcha. Right, the MV7, the only one with the voice isolation technology specifically, but with the MV88 being able to kind of narrow in on your subject, you can sort of get there to the same end result. Yeah, absolutely. You also uh, have a use for the MV88 kind of out in the world uh, when you're on the go? I do. In fact, uh, you, you might see it somewhere circling in the interwebs, but should you have the need to do some run and gun, uh, you know, videography and take a drum set out to uh, the pier at Huntington Beach and, uh, you know, capture it all on video and audio, uh, you might be able to do that with an MV88+. Plus. Yeah, and, and that's a real thing Mike's alluded to, so if you want to, if you want to check that <laughs> out, uh, hit our YouTube page. Um, yeah, but um, in all seriousness, though, like you, you can absolutely use this for run and gun, you know, content creating. You can use it for podcasting, interviews. There's lots of ways you can use this thing. It's just fantastic. Yeah, and it looks like you're using it just to headphone monitor us right now, even. 
Huh? Yeah, yeah, I am. So I, 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 uh, I also have my 1540s somewhere around here, but uh, I'm just monitoring in uh, through the headphone jack using some 215s for today. So you're, you're preaching to the choir yeah. on, on that front. <laughs> we're, we're, we're the fans of the in years. Um, yep. do, do you mind showing us real quick the the uh, the mode of app you're using to set up the uh, MB88? Yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, let me just share here. Uh, hang on one sec. Cool. Okay, so I uh, hope you guys can see what I'm working with here. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So right, so this is the uh, the settings that I have on my mic currently. We got a little bit of compression. Uh, probably should have kicked in the high pass filter, but no worries. Uh, no EQ. But uh, what I did for for some drum videos is I dialed in a preset. Um, so I just tied it the uh, MG drums. So it, as you can hear, it's you know dialing in my preset, and uh, it looks like it's. I've got some uh, some auto gain happening there. Courtesy um, of Zoom. Yep. Th thank you, the Zoom meeting interface. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so yeah. So just to run you through some of my settings here, this is kind of you know what I started with. Um, so you engage the limiter. You throw your compression to medium. Yep. Right. Okay. And then you have a little bit of EQ settings. Okay. Very. Slow. Yeah. I just that was just to capture a little bit more low end in my kick drum. You know, like that big thumpy kick drum. So. Yeah, a, a lot like Daryl. Mike Mike could dial up the metal in, in his drum in a, a, about another 12 <laughs> degrees, uh, but, but we asked them to keep it pretty tame for this clip. Yeah, yeah, definitely. MG, thanks so much, man. Thanks, we, man. we appreciate it. We're going to hear a little more of your drumming in just a sec. Great. Thanks, guys. Very cool. So we're, we're missing one. We are missing one. The MBI. MBI. Now, uh, a really cool That's thing to do got. is to plug in a vocal mic and sing into your MBI. That's usually what I would like to do, yes. I don't want to do it. But you said you were going to do it. I thought you were going to do it. You said you were going to do it. Uh, luckily, Zach and I got out of this. We got a friend <laughs> of the goodness. show, uh, Jessica Mahone. She's done some other audio gear uh, work with us, mm -hmm. uh, basically the vocalist for the audio gear band whenever we need to do something. Uh, we we're hoping to have her in studio, but, you know, 2021 is not quite as accommodating as we'd like it to be. So she's going KSM9 into the MVI, set at the music setting. Yeah, let's hear that real quick. It's been a long night, dear. Four cups of coffee, one Coke. Been trying to keep it together, but this morning I'm broke. Very cool. You know Very what? That nice. sounds good. It mm -hmm. sounds like it could use a bass. drum track. A bass? A bass. A couple of guitars, maybe? I, I think you might see where we're going here. I don't know. Uh, we're we're going to made with motive this into a full track but before we do that uh let's take care of some housekeeping the mv7 giveaway probably the reason why a lot of people are here today probably the reason they're <laughs> here uh we've been talking about a feature that is unique to the mv7 uh something that helps focus on your voice separates your voice from unwanted background noise it's what was really helping out Daryl as he was broadcasting live from the Vegas Strip there. So if you can remember that feature we're talking about on the MV7 uh, that, that really helps uh, narrow in on the solo performer. Of the human vocals. <laughs> of the human vocals. Go ahead, get into the chat window. But just also remember, uh, we're giving away a pair of SRH 440 headphones. Uh, head over to audiogear.com. Find your way to the Gear Talk page, subscribe to the newsletter, and we're going to announce the winner of this from anybody who signs up uh, for the Audio Gear newsletter. We'll get one winner yep. for the SRH 440s. We're keeping that open for five days after, right? Yep. So you got five days to subscribe, so don't lose your chance. And we've got our winner of the MV7, the voice isolation technology. It was Darren Lee. Darren Lee, congratulations, awesome. man. Well, we'll get your information and send this on down to you. And we want to thank our guests. Yes, we do. We want to thank Michael Pedersen. Michael Pedersen. Sure historian. Daryl Craig Harris. Daryl Craig Harris. The Music Audio Matters, Gear team. MusicMattersPodcast.com. Check Darryl. out Daryl. Uh, the production team, Kyle Gish, Justin Gear. We very, very much, much appreciate so. it. Couldn't do it without them. Nope. Uh, stay tuned. Two weeks and two days, January 28th. Gear SKB. Talk. SKB. We're back. Cases. SKB and Audio Gear. Yeah. Together again. Exactly. <laughs> and just remember, all this stuff was made with motive. Made with motive. Exactly. And let's hear all of the tracks we recorded uh, come together, and Jessica and Audio Gear Band are going to play us out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.
It's been a long night, dear. Four cups of coffee, one coke. Been trying to keep it together, but this morning I broke. So I packed up a suitcase with some hopes and some dreams. Whistling that sad song that you played for me. Trying hard to remember the time we last spoke, but the words are faded, the pictures all blurred from the mess I created and the lessons I've learned. 